ideas that come up in TDA, um, in particular, we're going to be focusing on something called one parameter persistent homology. Um, so what this talk won't be is a real in-depth dive into a bunch of complicated maths um, because that will take us many, many hours. So I'm going to give a kind of high level overview, just enough intuition to uh, get to the real meat of TDA, which is the persistence diagram and the stuff that you can do with it. Um, I also won't be talking too much about software. I'll give some hints towards software that can be useful as you go on. Um, but there is so much software and it's changing so often that it would be kind of a waste of time for me to say, oh, you should use this software and this is the API because next week it will be different. Um, so without further ado, um, let's get started. Um, so the general um, outline of the talk is that we'll start with some basic definitions from topology. Um, in particular, we're going to define a nice class of shapes which can live in a computer. These shapes are called simplicial complexes and they're basically built up by gluing lots of triangles together. Um, we'll then look at a theory called homology, which is basically a fancy piece of linear algebra which can pinpoint where holes are in shapes. Um, and then we'll move on to persistent homology, which is a theory which allows you to look at holes which appear in data sets. So Heather gave you some examples earlier of this idea of taking a point cloud and growing neighborhoods around all the points and looking at how holes form and get filled in. Um, that theory is persistent homology, and we'll have a look at a lot of the different concepts which come up in persistent homology. Um, and then we'll finish um, looking at some vectorizations of persistent homology. So these are tools that you can use to start plugging pH into your machine learning pipelines and really start to actually use them to do what I guess everyone here is interested in, which is machine learning. So um, that is the rough plan for today. Um, if at any point anyone has questions, I guess you can ask in the Slack and I'll have the Slack open um, just in case. But also, um, if that's okay with the organizers, feel free to shout out. Um, I'll try and leave space to questions. Okay, so let's get started with some official complexes. So to get started, we're going to start with a geometric building block. Um, and these geometric building blocks we're going to call N simplices. What an N simplex is, is it's the convex hull of N plus one points in Rn. And you can think of it as being like an N dimensional triangle. So to give you an idea of why I'm calling it this, a two simplex is the convex hull of three points. Here are three points in R2, and here's their convex hull. I'll fill it in. You can see that a two simplex is a triangle and we'll call that a two-dimensional triangle. Um, you can extend this notion so for example a three simplex is the convex hull of four points in R3 and if I draw it real quick it looks something like this but filled in and you can see that's a tetrahedron and you can keep going in higher and higher dimensions and get more general notions of what an n-dimensional triangle should be but for the purposes of today, because my poor pencil can't um, draw 10 dimensional shapes, uh, we'll stick with lower dimensional stuff um, for all our examples. And you can go in the other direction as well. So a one simplex is the convex hull of two points. And you should recognize that as being like a line or maybe um, even an edge. And a zero simplex is a convex hull of one point. So it's just a point. Um, and the really nice thing about simplices is that they have a nice combinatorial structure. So, for example, if I were to label these three points here, V0, V1 and V2, you'll note that I can actually specify this simplex simply by telling you which vertices it forms the convex hollow. So this simplex, which I'll call sigma, can be specified just by saying that it's the convex hull of V0, V1 and V2. So these geometric building blocks are really useful because they're really easy to store in a computer and to reason about. Okay. Now, a simplicial complex is a shape that you can get by gluing together lots of simplices. So in a similar way as to how a graph is an object you get by gluing together vertices with edges, a simplicial complex is like an object you get by gluing together vertices with edges and then also triangles and higher dimensional triangles. So you can think of it as being like a slightly more complicated notion of a graph, which lives in a higher dimension. 
So the way we build a simplicial complex is we start with some vertices, like these ones I've laid out here, and we start adding in edges. So for example, I might add in an edge between these two nodes and these two nodes, these two nodes and these two nodes. And um, I don't know, let's say these two nodes as well. And I'll put one in there. So you start by destroying a simple graph, essentially, by gluing on lots of one simplices between edges. Now there's a requirement that you can't put an edge between the same two vertices twice. So all of these graphs we draw have to be simple. You can't, for example, have um, another edge between these two nodes. And the reason we specify that is because we want this stuff to be entirely um, described by listing all the simplices in the complex. So for example, the simple complex I have at the moment can be described by just listing which edges I've added. So I've added an edge between V0 and V1 and V0 and V2 and so on. And that turns out to be really useful computationally. So that's the first restriction. Um, and now we keep going. So for example, I can start adding in some two simplices or triangles, and I can add them whenever I've got three edges which form the boundary of a triangle. So I could, for example, add in a two simplex to fill in these three edges. One thing I couldn't do is add in a two simplex to fill in, for example, here, because we're missing one of the edges. So that's the second condition we require in a simplicial complex. If you put in a simplex, you have to include all of its edges and higher dimensional faces. Okay, so that is a simplicial complex. And the really nice thing, as I said about simplicial complexes, is that you can store them really easily in a computer just by listing all the simplices that you've added. Um, okay, here are some examples of simplicial complexes. So in the top left, um, you can see some of the properties that you might not expect simplicial complexes to have. For example, you can mix together shapes of different dimensions. So here we have a simplicial complex, which has a tetrahedron and a triangle, et cetera. Um, and also it doesn't have to be connected. So in the simplicial complex in the top left, you'll notice that there's this disconnected edge in the middle. There's no requirement that all of these um, structures have to be connected. So that's a simplicial complex. Um, any simple graph, as I noted, is a simplicial complex. It's just a simplicial complex where we only add in one simplices and no higher order triangles. Um, but for example, um, like a non-simple graph isn't a simplicial complex because you have to have two edges between the same two vertices, which we don't allow. And finally, to maybe start to see the, the power of this notion, any kind of triangulated mesh that you might sort of imagine from sort of 3D graphics, um, it's also a simplicial complex, okay? So this dolphin here is a simplicial complex with lots and lots and lots of two simplices. And there is a theorem um, essentially saying that any um, sufficiently nice two manifold, for everyone who knows what a manifold is, um, admits a homeomorphic um, simplicial complex. So simplicial complexes are actually really, really broad categories of shape. Okay, now, as Heather mentioned, we're interested in finding holes in shapes. So here are a bunch of shapes with holes in them. Um, and you might ask me, um, you know, what do I mean by a hole? Mathematically, what, what actually is a hole? And the way I like to think about what a hole is, is the following. So if we look at the annulus in the top left in purple, um, and imagine that we draw like a piece of string in the middle of the annulus. So I'll rub it out. For example, I start here and maybe wiggle around and then tie it back together at the end. Um, so that's a loop in our annulus. And one thing you might notice is that we can't contract this loop down all the way down to a point because this hole in the middle oops, is obstructing that contraction. So one way to think of a hole is it's kind of like an obstruction to contracting a piece of string. Um, and you could have more than one obstruction. So for example, in the bottom left, there's one piece of string and another piece of string. And these strings can't be contracted, but they also can't be deformed into each other because they're wrapped around different holes. So a shape could have multiple holes, which you can think of as being multiple obstructions to contracting things. Now, holes don't have to be one dimensional. So the sphere in the middle of this shape, if you imagine that it's hollow, 
has a two dimensional hole in the middle of it or what we might call a void. And you can think of that as being like an obstruction to some kind of two dimensional contraction, which I won't draw because um, it will be embarrassing. Um, and similarly, the torus also has a void in the middle of it. But the interesting thing about the torus, I should say the torus is this um, donuts up here, is that it doesn't only have a two dimensional hole, it also has a one dimensional hole, right? And it's the hole which goes around like this. But actually the torus also has two um, one dimensional holes because it has another hole which goes around like this. And if you think about it, you'll realize that you can't um, stretch one of these pieces of string to match the other piece of string. Um, and we'll come back to that later. And then finally, um, simplicial complexes can also have holes. So in the bottom right, you see a very simple simplicial complex. And this simplicial complex has one hole, which wraps around this uh, loop here. Um, uh, this path here isn't a hole because the two simplex that we've filled in um, essentially allows you to contract your piece of string down. So a two simplex is kind of like a way of filling in a one dimensional hole. Okay. Now I told you that we have this mathematical machine which can find holes and that machine is called homology. Um, and I'm not gonna go into too much detail today, um, but homology is essentially a piece of linear algebra which takes as input a shape X and then given a dimension N outputs a vector space HN of X and the basis of that vector space is in one-to-one -one correspondence with the holes of the shape. Um, if you know what homology is, then you can substitute in your understanding of homology into the rest of this talk. If you don't know what homology is, just picture it as this black box, which gives you a vector space, um, the basis elements of which correspond to holes in our shape. And because the basis elements correspond to holes, the dimension of this vector space tells you the number of holes, and we call those dimensions Betty numbers. So the nth Betty number, beta n of a shape, is simply the dimension of this hn of x, this vector space which tells you the number of n-dimensional holes. And let's see some examples of what this is. So beta zero tells you the number of zero-dimensional holes, and as Heather mentioned, a zero-dimensional hole is like a connected component. So beta zero measures the number of connected components in your shape. As an example, on the simplicial complex on the right, you can see there are three connected components. So for this simplicial complex, we'll have beta zero equal to three. Beta one tells you a number of one dimensional holes or loops. And in this simplicial complex, you can see that there are two different one dimensional holes. There's the one which wraps around, I think I'm with color, the one which wraps around here, and the one which wraps around here. So in this simplicial complex, we have the beta one is two. And continuing, beta two is the number of two dimensional holes or voids. In this simplicial complex, because this shape in the bottom right is hollow, we have a two dimensional hole or a void. So in this simplicial complex, we have that beta two is one. And you can continue on and think about higher dimensional holes. But again, for the limitations of my artistic ability, um, we're not gonna see any of those today. Um, so yeah, this is homology. Um, let's see some more Betty numbers so we get comfortable with what's going on. Um, the shape in the top left, um, our work sort of maybe clockwise, um, the shape in the top left has one connected component. So it has Betty zero equal to one. It has one loop. So it has beta one equal to one. It doesn't have any two dimensional holes. So Betty two is equal to zero. Um, similarly, the next shape, which is the red one, um, this has one connected component. So Betty zero is one. And this one has four holes. And this might be trickier to see, so I'll draw them. We have a hole which wraps around here, one which wraps around here, one around here, and one around here. So there are four holes. So Betty one of this object is equal to four to correspond to the four loops. 
And then again, there are no two dimensional holes. So Betty two is zero. Um, let's move down to the piece of cheese in the bottom left. So here I've drawn a simpatial complex, which has, you can see kind of the same holes as the, the cheese. Um, and the idea here really I'm trying to get across is that you can really approximate lots and lots of shapes of simpatial complexes. You can get a simpatial complex the same kind of structure of holes as the initial shape. Um, and again, this thing has Becky zero equal to one because there's one connected component. Um, and if we count the number of holes, you can see there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So Betty one is equal to seven. And again, Betty two is equal to zero. Um, so those are some examples of official complexes of one dimensional holes. In the top right, we've already seen this example. If you have a hollow tetrahedron, this has a void in the middle. So it has Betty two equal to one, but there are no one dimensional holes. They've all been filled in. So Betty one is equal to zero. And again, there's one connected component. So Betty zero is equal to one. And if you think about it for a second, you'll realize that exactly the same thing is true about the dolphin shape. So these Betty numbers also correspond to the dolphin down here. Okay, those are some examples of Betty numbers. Um, so to summarize this section, um, the first thing we did is we built up some complicated shapes from some simple building blocks called simplices. The simplices are like n-dimensional triangles and the shapes that we brought up from them are called simplicial complexes. You can describe simplicial complexes combinatorially by listing the simplices in which they're made up. And we have this nice theory called homology, which can uh, tell you where holes are in simplicial complexes. And we have this Betty number, B to N, which tells you how many n-dimensional holes there are in a shape. Um, are there any questions about simplicial complexes or homology before I move on? Sorry, just one, a really quick one. Uh, yeah, so you said ahead. that the homology maps kind of your data to this uh, uh, vector space. And yeah. you said that the dimension of the vector space uh, corresponds to the number of holes or is the number of holes related to the Betty numbers? I kind of got lost there. Okay, sure. Um, so let me go back to this. So yeah, the dimension of the vector space is the number of holes. And in fact, we've defined the Betty number to be the dimension of the vector space. So they're both the number of holes. Does that make sense? Uh, uh, yes, but what, I'm, what I mean is that, okay, like we said that beta zero is the number of zero dimensional holes. Beta mm -hmm. one is the number of loops. So mm -hmm. I'm kind of wondering if the dimension of the best vector space is the sum of all of these, or maybe I got it. I see, okay, that's a very good question. So um, we actually have a sequence of vector spaces, one for each dimension. So there's a vector space H0, which is the basis of which corresponds to zero dimensional I see, I see. connected components. Okay, so, I see. Okay, I see, thank Great you Great question. Much. Thanks very much. Okay. So yeah, I should say, um, you pick your dimension and then you get a vector space corresponding to that dimension. And that's actually very important. So thank you for asking. Okay. Are there any other questions on this before we move on? Okay, fantastic. Then let's move ahead to maybe the meat of this talk, which is persistent homology. Um, so let me pose a setting to you. Let's imagine that we have some shape which lives in our end. That shape might be a circle or it might be a torus or it might be something really wacky. Um, and let's suppose that we have some process which samples points from this shape. And what we'd like to do is we'd like to use those points to recover what the homology of the shape is. So we want to recover how many holes there are of this shape. But the problem we have is that if you sample finitely many points from a shape, there are no holes going on here, okay? All you really have is a bunch of disjoint points. There's no connectivity going on. So you're gonna to struggle to see any holes. So we need a way to deal with this. And the way we deal with this is with using persistent homology. And as Heather mentioned, what we do in persistent homology or pH is we construct a sequence of simplicial complexes and we track how the homology changes as you move through the sequence. And the idea is, is that um, topological features of the initial shape we sampled from will somehow show through as more persistent features as we track these changes. Um, so for example, on this picture here, you'll notice that the points I've sampled kind of look like they're from a circle, 
And at one point in our sequences and facial complexes, namely this one here, um, it looks like we have um, one loop in our superficial complex. So we'd hope that when we perform this um, sequence of complexes, this loop will hang around for a long time and so we'll be able to pick out that our initial shape had one hole. That's the idea. Okay, so the main definition that we need to do this is a filtration. And all a filtration is, is it's a sequence of nested superficial complexes indexed by the reals. So for every real number, you're going to give me a superficial complex. And I have this requirement that the earlier superficial complexes have to fit into the later ones. So what I mean by that is that every simplex which appears in Ks must also appear in Kt, so long as s is less than t. Um, and here is an example um, of just four um, superficial complexes which might live in a filtration. And you'll notice that whenever I have a simplex um, on the left, every simplex to its right um, is still there. So for example, um, this edge here appears in every single simplicial complex to the right of it. Similarly, this two simplex appears in every simplicial complex to the right and so on. Um, and what's interesting about this, you might notice is that we start to have some homology appear and then get filled in as we move through our filtration. So for example, a hole is formed here, which seems to eventually get filled in at this time step. So here the hole is filled in. And we'd like a way of tracking this information. And the way we track it is with something called a barcode, which is what Heather was talking about earlier. So what a barcode does is it tracks how holes or features in our homology form and then get filled in as we move through our parameter t. And the best way to see this is for me to just draw you one. Um, so let's do that. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at these simplicial complexes. Whenever I see a hole, I'm going to draw a bar. The start point of that bar is going to be um, the level of filtration where the hole is formed. And then the bar is going to continue on until I reach a point where the hole has been filled in. So for example, let's focus on this hole here. So it gets formed at uh, this timestamp one. But then when we get to timestamp two, you'll notice that it's been filled in. We've added in a two simplex, so the hole has been filled in. So we're going to draw a bar from timestamp one to timestamp two. Um, now there's another hole which um, is formed here. So we'll start a bar at time step two, and you'll notice that this hole doesn't get filled in until we reach time step four. So this bar is gonna go from time step two to time step four. And then finally, um, another hole is formed here at time step three, and that hole also gets filled in at time step four. So I'll have a final bar which goes from time step three to time step four. And the end result is this collection of bars, we can think of it as being a multi-set of bars, um, where the left and right endpoints of the bars correspond to birth and death scales of holes in our filtration. Um, we've got a question. Yeah, so for for that like T3, where you create basically two triangles, um, uh, should you have two barcodes or just one because they both get filled in? I see, so um, at T equals three, um, we have two holes here and here. Yeah. Okay. So we need to have two bars to represent these two different holes. So we have two bars and then they both get filled in at the next stage. So we end both of the bars. Does that make sense? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, I guess my question was whether or not that long bar from T2 to T4, it encompasses the hole that was like generated. Does that make sense? I see. So you're asking- um, Like should example, there be like, like one extra line underneath or not? Right, so I think uh, you may be asking, um, so there's this hole here. Uh -huh. How do we know that it doesn't say die here and then a new bar forms rather than this thing continuing on? Is that mm -hmm. maybe what you're asking? I think so. Okay, yeah, so basically um, this is one of the details which I've kind of swept under the rug by telling you that homology is just a black box. Um, so I told you that this is maybe, this answer may be too technical, but it's the best I can give you. Um, what we have here is a sequence of vector spaces, so 
H1 um, vector spaces. So we have, I'll call the vector spaces V and W. Um, and when we have this inclusion of one simplicial complex into the other simplicial complex, what that gives us is a linear map between the homology vector spaces. Okay. Um, and so we can kind of tell um, whether or not this hole corresponds to this hole by looking and seeing if the feature we're looking at in one vector space gets matched to this other feature um, by our linear map. Okay, um, so there is kind of an unambiguous way to resolve this thing, um, but without doing any maths, um, you just have to trust me when I say that I'm kind of, what happens is that this hole kind of gets shrunk down to this hole. Um, I'm sorry, that's not a very satisfactory answer, but does it maybe give you an idea? Kind of, it just feels unintuitive because the bar underneath it is representing mm -hmm. that it's getting filled in by that bottom like triangle. So um, it feels like you're double counting, like like two events happen, but you're counting it as one. So I, I don't know, I just feel unintuitive. But I see, also so the, okay, so the event that I count as um, filling in this bar here is um, this two simplex appearing, okay? okay. And the event which counts this bar appearing is this one simplex appearing. So this one simplex kind of splits this bar into two different bars, but neither mm. of them have been filled in. Okay. Does that maybe help a bit? I, I, yeah, I think I, I think I was looking at it differently. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, the, the the basic answer is that um kind of the linear algebra which I've ignored kind of solves all these problems for you, um but yeah. Okay, um, let's see another example. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and start drawing bars here. Um, so at the start of this uh, filtration, we have two holes, okay? The first hole gets filled in straight away, okay? Oh, I should say this hole is the first hole, and it gets filled in right here. So we have a bar which starts at timestamp one and then dies at timestamp two. And in fact, the second hole here also dies at timestamp two. So we have two bars going from time set one to time set two. Um, and then time set two, we notice we have this really big hole here, which gets formed. And that one doesn't get filled in until time stamp four. So I have a bar which goes from time set two to time set four. And then finally at time set three, we get the same behavior, which um, was confusing before where the hole gets split into two holes by the addition of a new one simplex. Um, so you have a new one simplex form because you split this big hole up um, and then it dies at time step four. So we get a barcode that looks like this. And one interesting feature to note about this barcode is that we have two bars now with exactly the same birth and death times. So our barcode is really a multi-set, okay? We have to record the multiplicity that these bars appear in because um, there is a difference between having one bar uh, a certain scale and having two bars. Okay. So the barcode is a multi-set of these intervals which records how homological features, i.e. holes, form and then get filled in as you move through our filtration. Now, what we'd like is a way of kind of automatically generating these filtrations from some data. We don't just want someone to have to sit down and start drawing in little simplicial complexes whenever they give you data. Um, and a very, very popular way of doing this is something called a check complex. So let's start with a point cloud living in RN. Um, sorry, let's type it there. That should be a capital N. Let me draw that in. Um, so let's start with a finite point cloud in RN. Um, and then for a point in this point cloud, I'm going to denote by uh, point X in this point cloud and the radius R, I'm going to denote by BXR, the open ball around, um, or the closed ball around this point of radius R. Okay, so it's all the points which are at a distance that most are from our original points. Um, so if you look down here, you can see all of these purple circles are open balls around each of these points in our point cloud. So that's a notation. And then I'm going to form a simplicial complex, which takes input the point cloud and a radius, 
and then construct some n syntheses. And what it will do is if you give me n points, sorry, n plus one points, it will construct an n simplex between those n plus one points, if and only if all of their balls have um, non-empty intersection. Um, and this is again something which is best um, seen to understand. So let's start drawing in a check complex on this point cloud. So I'm going to start by drawing in edges. And an edge appears whenever two vertices have balls which intersect. So these two vertices have, let me draw that bigger. These two vertices have an edge between them because the two balls around them have an intersection here. Similarly, these two vertices have an edge, these two have an edge, these two have an edge. As to these two, these two, these two, and these two. And finally, these two. Okay, so we can add in some edges. And we added an edge whenever the two balls around two points have an intersection. Now, if we want to draw in a two simplex between three points, we have to require that the intersection of all three balls is not empty. So for example, um, if we look over on the left over here, we won't draw in the two simplex there because even though we have a pairwise intersection between all of the balls, you'll notice that there's actually no point which lives inside all three balls. So you won't add in a two simplex here. But on the right, um, we have um, two collections of three edges, both of which their corresponding points have non-empty three-way intersection. So for example, um, if we look at these three points, they have a three-way intersection here. So we'll add in a two simplex to represent that. And we see the same behavior with this other collection of three points. Okay, so if you give me a point cloud on the radius, I can construct a simplicial complex, which I'll call the check complex. Question from Sun. Uh, yeah. Um, my question is about the uh, yeah the n the n simplex. Is this uh, like the maximal n you can pick? Is it like uh, depends on the dimension? So like in this case, it's like maximally two. I see. Yeah, really good question. So um, the answer is that I'm kind of imagining. So for example, the picture I've drawn here lives like in R two simply because like my iPad screen is two dimensional. I'm kind of imagining that I've embedded all of these points in a high enough dimensional space that you can kind of add in however many simplices you want. So for example, um, let's just say that I, I don't know, I had um, like an extra point here, right, which has some extra two simplices, some extra one simplices between them, okay? Um, maybe that's a bad example, sorry. Let's suppose that these two points are both connected by a one simplex. Um, if all the balls, or if all four balls intersected, I could happily add in um, a three simplex or a tetrahedron between those four points. Okay, so I'm not restricting myself to only work in the dimension that you've given me the points. I'm kind of assuming that the dimension is high enough that I can add in any kind of um, mm -hmm. higher dimensional simplices that you like. So Does that answer your question? I, I think so. In essence, you can just add multiple edges, even in this picture right here, even though it's 2D, but you can still define like n simplices for n higher than two. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So you can keep going Um, kind of, again, just for artistic reasons, everything here is living in dimension two, okay, but great. essentially you can still embed in higher dimensions. Yeah, great okay, question. Great. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so that's the check complex. And the idea is now is that if you vary this radius parameter, so you imagine growing these balls as you move through time, you'll end up with a filtration where the arc um, simplicial complex in filtration is the check complex at radius r. Okay, so that's a filtration. Um, and there's another really popular type of filtration called the Viatoris rips complex. And this is very, very similar to the check complex. In fact, you can see it as an approximation to the check complex. And essentially what we say here is that you have an N simplex between um, N plus one vertices if every pairwise intersection is non-empty. Okay, so we don't require, for example, to add a two simplex that 
all three balls have some common intersection, we only require that each pair of balls has an intersection. In other words, we're going to add in an n-simplex whenever all of the edges that we need to form the n-simplex are present. So here on your screen, you can see um, the check complex from earlier. And all that changes here is that we're going to fill in this two simplex here because all three edges are present. So all these pairwise intersections are non empty. So you can see that um, the check complex is always contained in the Viator's Ritz complex because if you have um, pairwise intersection, so if you have um, n way intersection, you're always going to have pairwise intersection. So you can kind of view this the um, Viator Ritz complex as an approximate information to the check complex. Um, oh, let me make one more point about the check complex, actually. Um, so let's look at the holes in the check complex. Um, and oh, in fact, let me go back to this one. Here's the check complex. Um, you'll notice something interesting, which is that the um, union of balls um, that you can see in purple has one hole, which lives here. But also the simplicial complex I've drawn, the check complex also has one hole, which lives around here. And that's really no um, coincidence. There's actually a theorem, which we'll call a nerve theorem, which basically says that um, the union of balls and the check complex have the same holes. So in some sense, the check complex is kind of a way of combinatorializing this idea of growing balls around all your points. Now, the reason I'm pointing this out is that the Viator Swift complex does not have this property. So when I fill in this two simplex, we lose this correspondence between the holes of the union of balls and the holes of the um, Viator Swift complex. So a perfectly valid question would be, why would we ever look at the Viator Swift complex instead of the check complex? It feels like we're losing information about topology. Um, and the answer is that um, it's much, much faster to compute. Um, essentially here, we're only looking at pairwise distances between points rather than n-way um, intersections. And that turns out to be really, really fast. Um, so a piece of software, which I think Heather mentioned called RIPSA, this is kind of the state of the art for um, persistent homology computation at the moment. Um, and this exclusively calculates Viator's Ritz complexes. So if you really want to do fast pH computation, um, Viator's Ritz complexes turn out to be the way to go. Um, the good news is that as long as most of your holes aren't just triangles, um, you shouldn't lose too much information. So it's kind of a fair trade to make for the performance gains that you get. Okay. Are there any questions about either of those filtrations before I carry on? Okay, fantastic. Okay, one more um, piece of information we need before we actually start seeing some real examples. I promise we're gonna see some actual data soon. Um, there's an equivalent way of representing this information we have in a barcode. So remember a barcode is a multi-set of intervals like the one on the left, um, which encodes the birth and death scales of homological features. Now, if I um, take those birth and death scales and just plot them as points in the plane, I get some called a persistence diagram. Um, and this persistence diagram is a multi-set of points, so each point corresponds to a bar in the barcode. So let me draw a persistence diagram for you. So let's start by adding in a point for the first purple bar. And the purple bar is born at time two and dies at time six. So what I'll do in the persistence diagram is I'll add in a point with birth scale two and death scale six like that. Um, the second bar is born at scale five and dies at scale six, so I'll add in a point here. The green bar dies at scale two-ish and dies at scale four, so we get a point here. And finally, this orange bar, oops, this orange bar is born at time one and dies at time five, so we'll have a point here. Okay, and so in this way, we can transform this um, set of intervals into a collection of points in the plane. And this just turns out to be much easier to work with, um, as we'll see in a second. 
But the important thing is we haven't lost any information. These are entirely equivalent ways of recording the homology of our filtration of simplicial complexes. The difference is that one is maybe a bit more compact. Okay. Now, this is the, the real take home message. I'm going to define the persistence of a bar to be its length. So the difference between its depth and its birth scales. And we have this general philosophy in topological data analysis that persistent bars somehow correspond to signal. So topological features of the underlying shape that you sampled your points from. And less persistent bars correspond to noise. So artifacts of the sampling process you use to get the points. So for example, in this um, diagram, these points up here, are more persistent, so they probably correspond to topological feature. And these points down here are less persistent, so they're probably topological noise. Okay, now I don't have any theorems to um, give you to explain this, but this is the general philosophy that we use. And so if we imagine that this persistence diagram was sampled for some shape, because there are three um, because there are three uh, features in the persistence diagram, we might assume that um, the Betty number, and let's say it's Betty one, of the original shape is three, because we have these three standout features. That's the general um, method of topological inference that we're gonna make. And I'm now gonna show you a bunch of examples to make this uh, concept hopefully much more clear. So here on the left, we have a bunch of points sampled from a circle. Um, I've added in some noise, so they're not perfectly sampled from the circle, there's a bit of variance, but speaking the sample from the circle. And let's think about what happens when we form the Czech or Viatoris Ritz complex of this uh, collection of points. And what's going to happen essentially is that very early on we're going to have lots of connections of neighboring points like this. So early on, roughly at the distance between neighboring points, we're going to form a one-dimensional feature, okay, a hole in dimension one which goes right the way around the circle. And for that hole to fill in completely, what we're going to need is for essentially there to be some triangles forming like this. Once a triangle like that starts to form and we, we get loads of them, some here, one here, for example, etc., then eventually the feature will be filled in, okay? And um, we'll have a bar which dies in our persistence diagram. And that's exactly what you can see on the persistence diagram on the right. So on the right, we have a persistence diagram looking at one dimensional holes. And you can see we have this standout feature in the top right, or the top left, um, which dies, which is born quite early on and which dies quite late on. And this feature exactly corresponds to this one dimensional hole that I've just explained um, exists. So you can see um, based on the um, general philosophy I just told you about, you can kind of infer from this persistence diagram, these points down here are noise, and this point up here is topological feature. Okay, and so we can conclude that Betty one of our original shape is one. And indeed we sample from a circle, so that seems like a reasonable inference to make. Okay. Um, here's another example. So now I've just increased the noise um, which I sampled from. Um, and you can see we still recover very much the same property. We have one really persistent feature, which corresponds to the Betty one of the circle. And the noise is maybe getting a bit noisier, okay? These um, noisy features are getting a bit more persistent, but still it's under control. And this highlights the general feature of persistent homology, which um, I'll explain in more detail later, which is that it's kind of stable to these kind of perturbations. If you add in some noise, um, you're still gonna recover a similar persistence diagram. Um, okay, here's an example of two circles. So again, when we form this uh, filtration, very early on, we'll end up with a, a hole here and another hole here. So we'll expect to have two bars. And again, they both only get filled in when we get to a high enough radius that we start to get triangles formed like this. Okay, and indeed on the right, you can see we have two features, two points in our persistence diagram, which are born fairly early on and then die quite late. So these two features correspond to the two holes in our original shape. So we can conclude that Bessie one of the original shape is probably two because there are two 
one dimensional features. Um, here's a slightly more um, subtle example. So now I put four um, circles together. And again, by the same logic, um, we have these four standout features which correspond to the four circles that you can see here. But there's also this feature here, which is maybe a bit surprising, right? I put four circles in, why have I got this extra feature, which somehow exists in the space between noise and feature. So there's something odd going on there. Um, and the answer is, is that this, um, this point actually corresponds to this hole which forms in between the four circles. So we have this extra fifth hole which is forming and this hole has a lower radius. So essentially what happens is that it gets filled in quicker because it's easier to form these triangles than it is to form these triangles. Um, so we can see this um, hole, which even though it's born at a very similar time, it dies much earlier. And this is telling us that um, persistent homology is somehow able to detect not just the topology of your shape, but also some of the geometry. So smaller features are going to die earlier. So this tells us a bit of geometric information about our shape, as well as topological information about holes. Um, okay, now let's see a two-dimensional example. So on the left, you can see some points in 3D sampled from a sphere. And on the right now, I've changed the persistence diagram a little bit. So in blue, these points down here, this corresponds to um, one-dimensional holes. And then the orange is 2D holes. And I plotted them both on the same persistence diagram to save some space. And what you'll notice is that there's loads and loads of um, noise in one dimension, but no standout features. And that's because there are no holes in one dimension on the surface of the sphere. But there is a really big 2D hole on the surface of the sphere, namely the void inside it. And so we get one standout uh, two-dimensional feature. So from this, we can conclude that Betty 1 is 0 and Betty 2 is 1, corresponding to the holes in the sphere. Um, and finally, I sampled now points of a torus. And you might remember from way early on in the tutorial, we said that um, when you draw a torus, like this one, we have a 2D hole or void, which lives inside the torus. And we also have two 1D holes, one which goes around the hole in the center, and then one which wraps around um, the kind of uh, radius of the, of the torus itself. So we'd expect to find that Betty 2 is 1 and Betty 1 is 2. Okay, because there are two one-dimensional features and one two-dimensional feature. And indeed, as you can see, that's exactly what happens. You have these two standout dimension one features corresponding to Betty one being two, and a standout dimension two feature, which corresponds to Betty two being one. So you can see in this way, by um, considering which uh, points are more persistent, we can recover information about a shape that we might have sampled from. And this is the kind of topological inference which um, really drives home persistent homology. Okay, are there any questions on any of those examples before I move on to um, some more theory? Hi, uh, there's a couple of questions on the Slack. Um, okay, um, I can read them if you want. Oh, you, um, oh if you have them open, yeah, that's cool. yeah, fantastic. Okay, so, okay, we've got two questions from Pavel. Um, the first question is, um, how stable are the persistent diagrams um, when resampling uh, and subsampling? Um, so that's a very, very good question. And this is, I think, um, this isn't necessarily my area of research, but um, I've seen some work on this. Um, I believe there is a group at Imperial which is looking at stuff like this. And I think it's quite recent work. And the basic answer is that you can do stuff like bootstrapping. And I think um, there are results along the lines of, if you do some bootstrapping on um, some sample, you can kind of recover the entire persistence of an entire point cloud based on subsamples. Um, it's a very, very wishy-washy answer. It's not my area, but that is an active area of research. And I think there are some positive results. So hopefully that helps uh, with question one. Um, and then uh, question two is um, that the check and VR complexes are heavily affected as uniform noise. So I assume what you mean by that is, um, for example, if I, let's go back to the circle, if I added in some more points in the, just everywhere, I think that's what you mean by uniform noise. Um, and then the question is that um, Pavel has heard that it's worth it to filter out points in regions of small density. 
Um, and the question is, um, what are some techniques we can use to deal with this problem? Um, the answer is, um, this is something that something called multi-parameter persistence is useful for. I'll briefly mention it at the end of the talk, so just hang on um, for another 20 minutes and I'll get to that. Okay, fantastic. I'm going to carry on now and make some more progress. Thank you for the great questions. Okay, so to talk about stability, um, what we'd like to have is a distance on persistence diagrams. So if you give me two persistence diagrams, tell me um, how far apart they are in some sense. And perhaps the um, most standard distance you can use is something called the bottleneck distance. So first some definitions. Um, I'm going to denote by delta the multi-set which contains all of the diagonal points in the plane with infinite multiplicity. Um, and why I'm considering this will become apparent in a second. And then I'm going to consider D1 and D2, which are two persistence diagrams. And remember, these are also multi-sets of points in R2. Um, now, a matching is a multi-bijection between one persistence diagram along with this diagonal delta to the other persistence diagram along with a diagonal delta. So what this really means is that I'm matching points in D1 and D2, except if I like, I can um, just not match a point and instead match it to a point in the diagonal. And the reason which we do this essentially is because um, we want to handle um, cases where two persistence diagrams have different cardinality. So it will allow you to map something to the diagonal instead of to another point in the persistence diagram. Um, and if we have one of these matchings, I'm going to define the cost of it to be um, essentially the largest distance between a point and the point that it gets matched to over all the points in the persistence diagram and the diagonal. And I should remark um, that this distance is um, an infinity distance. So um, it's the soup norm of um, R2 rather than the Euclidean distance. So that's just a technical detail, which doesn't really matter. Um, and then I'm going to say that the bottleneck distance between two persistence diagrams is the minimal cost across all possible matching. So give me any matching you like, I'll choose the one with the smallest possible cost and that'll be my bottleneck distance. So it's the distance between the two furthest apart points in the most optimal matching of my two persistence diagrams. Um, and here's an illustration. So what I've done here is I've drawn two persistence diagrams on the same plane. One of them is in purple and the other one is in green. And I've illustrated the possible matching. So some of the points just get matched together um, as you'd expect. So for example, these two points get matched together, etc. Some of the points have no obvious matching. So we're just going to match them down to the diagonal instead. Um, and then the um, bottleneck distance, assuming this is an optimal matching, is essentially the largest distance between any two of these points that we've matched. So um, it looks like it's the distance between these two points in this example. Or maybe not, I don't know. It doesn't really matter. One of these points will be the largest um, and that will be the bottleneck distance. Um, and you can see that this persistence diagram is quite well matched. Um, so the bottleneck distance is going to be quite small here. But what if I removed one of these points? Let's say I got rid of this purple point. So now the green point doesn't really have um, a good partner to match to. So essentially what we're forced to do is to match it down to the diagonal instead. And now you can see that we have um, a big problem because this arrow is absolutely huge and our bottleneck distance is going to be massive. So that should give you an idea of the kind of ways in which persistence diagrams can be different. If you have a really persistent feature, which um, doesn't show up in one diagram, you're gonna have a very large bottleneck distance between the two diagrams. Um, okay. And the reason we have this distance is that we can start to say um, stability theorem. So how stable is uh, persistent homology with respect to different perturbations of the data or the method of filtration that we use, et cetera. There are loads of these theorems in persistent homology, and I won't dare to um, try and give you an exhausted list. Um, but here's a particularly nice one that we can state just using all the terminology that we've introduced today. So let's choose two point clouds. Let's assume they have this property that there's some epsilon, so that every point in one point cloud has a corresponding point in the other point cloud, which is at most epsilon apart. This is a two-way property, so this matching goes both ways. So if the two point clouds are close in this sense, then um, 
if we construct the via torus rips persistence diagrams of the two point clouds, the bottleneck distance between them is at most two epsilon. So what this is really saying is um, if you imagine um, a point cloud here, and let's suppose that I just add some noise to my sampling process. So maybe this point moves over here, this point moves there, this point moves there, and so on. Um, the distance of the corresponding distance diagrams is going to be bounded by twice the distance we've just moved all these points. So we have a stability with respect to some noise, noise being some um, small perturbation. Now, as Pavel points out in um, his question, um, this doesn't work, for example, if I add in some extra points. So if I add in a point over here, um, this epsilon is now going to be absolutely huge. And so I don't have any guarantees now that the two persistence diagrams are going to be particularly close. Okay, so that's stability. Okay, so to summarize this um, rather long part, um, in persistent homology, what we do is we associate a sequence of simplicial complexes to a point cloud. And we call that sequence of filtration. There are two really common choices of filtration, namely the check complex and the Viatoris Rip complex. And they, roughly speaking, study how the topology of a growing um, collection of balls around each point changes. And if we track how these uh, features are born and die over time, we get a um, topological summary called a barcode or a persistence diagram. And the more persistent features in this diagram correspond to signal of our original um, sample, and the rest correspond to noise, so sampling bias. Um, and we have this result that persistent homology is stable with respect to small perturbations of our input data. So this really um, validates it for use in data science. Okay, any questions about um, persistent homology so far? Uh, I would like to know just a general question. Uh, so you Go stated ahead. the previous result on the VR complex. Mm -hmm. Do we have like some sort of guarantees that since like VR is an approximation of the Czech complex that generally if one of, like do you get, usually get results that go across different complexes or they're often linked to the complex you're using? Um, yeah, so the answer is yeah, there are results that compare different complexes. Um, the language to state those results is quite subtle and so not something I really want to build up in this talk. But essentially you can say that if there are kind of two filtering functions, whatever a filtering function is, um, and those two filtering functions are reasonably similar, you consider their distance in some function space, then the corresponding um, barcodes will be similar. So you can imagine if you can get some way to compare your filtrations by comparing these filtering functions, whatever they are, you can compare the barcodes. Is that satisfactory as an answer? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we cool. just wanted to know. Fantastic. Um, really, like, stability theorems are huge in TDA. Like, everyone loves them. So if you, if you name something, um, either there will be a result or there will be someone out there desperate to prove it because people just love stability theorems. OK. Uh, OK, let me move on now. Um, we'll have another maybe 10, 15 minutes of um, of results and then some time for some last questions. Okay, so the last part of this talk, we're going to look at something called vectorizations of persistence diagrams. And the idea here is that you want to come up with some representation of a persistence diagram, which can be expressed as a vector. And this is going to give us two real benefits. The first thing is that we can um, compute the average persistent homology of a collection of point clouds by averaging the vectors point size. And that would be really useful because this allows you to compare, for example, samples drawn from two different processes um, and stuff like this. And the second advantage, which is really relevant for today, is that once you have a vector, you can stick it into a machine learning pipeline, whatever you like. Name your favorite machine learning pipeline, um, you can stick it in. And so this allows you to start doing some topological machine learning. Um, today, I'm not going to go into too much detail about all the constructions. I'm just going to give you an overview of what kinds of things are out there. Um, the first thing is going to be a persistence image, which is something that looks like an image. Um, and the second thing is a persistence landscape, which, surprise, is something that looks like a landscape. And you'll see in a second what I mean. So let's start with persistence images. And I'm going to start with a little um, transformation. So I'm going to define this um, linear map on R2, which sends 
a point x, y to the point x, y minus x. And the point of this is that basically what it does on persistence diagrams is it sends the birth death pair to a birth persistence pair. And you can see what this transformation does here. Okay, this line kind of gets smooshed down and the resulting birth persistence diagram um, takes up the entire square. And the point here really is that we're gonna form an image in a second and we don't want there to be all this dead space in our, our image. So we're just gonna transform the space so that we get something that fills an entire um, square patch. Okay, now given a point in Rn, I'm going to let GU be the symmetric Gaussian with mean U and variant sigma squared. So what I mean here is that I've drawn some 2D Gaussian on top of my point with some fixed variance. And I'm going to fix a weighting function F from R2 to R. And what this weighting function is going to do essentially, I won't give you a definition of one, but what it's going to do is weight more persistent features higher. So when we perform our construction in a second, we wanna have a higher weighting on more persistent features because remember our general philosophy is that more persistent features matter more. So given those two um, pieces of information and a persistence diagram D, we're going to define a persistent surface, which is a function from the plane to the real numbers. And this persistent surface is given by summing over every point in our transform persistence diagram. The Gaussian at that point multiplied by this weight given at this point by the weighting function. And this gives us a smooth surface, I'm pretty sure it's smooth, um, defined on the plane. Um, and I'll show you an example of this in a second, but what we can do is we can discretize. So if you give me the surface and I draw a grid, I can sample one point in each cell of my grid um, and I get something vectorized. So I get a matrix of pixel intensity values of this surface. Um, and here's an example. So what you can see is that um, we've kind of drawn um, little circles around each of these points. Um, in fact, these circles are actually Gaussian, so they're taller in the middle and they spread out. Um, and I've made the circles which are higher up have a higher weight. So these patches up here are brighter because the weighting function has weighted more persistent features higher. And if I add all of these Gaussians together, I get an image like the one you see here. And all I've done here is just sampled from some subsampling of the grid to get an image. And you can choose you know, the, the rate at which you sample. Maybe you want a coarser grid or you want a finer grid. And now this is a vector which you can readily use in any machine learning that um, might strike your fancy. Um, there are some theorems. So um, Heather mentioned um, stability. Um, assuming you choose your weighting function reasonably well, um, this persistence image is stable um, in the sense that two similar persistence diagrams will give you two similar persistence images. So again, we have stability right the way through from point cloud, the persistence diagram, the persistence image. So again, this validates um, this methodology uh, for data science. Okay, I won't say too much more on that. Um, the next factorization is called a persistence landscape. And this one is slightly different. We're going to construct a sequence of functions from the reals to the reals, which somehow um, encapsulates um, how the more persistent information changes as you move through time. So given a pair in my persistence diagram, uh, BD, I'm going to define this, um, what did Heather call it? Heather called it a tent function. Um, from the reels to the reels, which if you imagine I have a bar here, looks like this. I think I'll highlight it. So outside the bar is zero. And inside the bar, it increases up to the midpoint and then starts decreasing again. So it looks like this. Okay, and I can form one of these to every single bar in my barcode. So if I had another bar, say here, then I can draw another um, peak, which looks like this. And so on. And now I define a sequence of functions, lambda one, lambda two, lambda three, et cetera, where lambda k um, of t takes the kth largest value 
over all of the points in our persistence diagram of this function fi of t. Okay, so this k max here means k's largest value. And what I get here then is a sequence of functions. And you can kind of imagine the kth function is recording how persistent the kth most persistent feature is at a given scale. And that's very wishy-washy, but that just gives you an intuition. Um, on this um, two bar barcode I've drawn here, um, we get two functions. One, oh, that's a bad color. We choose a better color. Um, one looks like this, so it goes up here, and then it joins this peak and goes down. And the other is zero up to here, and then jumps up to this peak and then jumps back down. Okay. So you get a sequence of functions um, increasing. So lambda one is always bigger at every point than lambda two, which is always bigger at every point than lambda three, and so on. Um, in other words, we can structure the function from the naturals across the reals into the reals. Um, here's an example. So on the left is a persistence diagram, and I've just suggestively drawn some triangles um, onto this persistence diagram. And you can imagine if we rotated the persistence diagram down and then traced out these contours. So here's the first contour. And here's the second contour. And so on. Um, we'd arrive at the picture on the right. So this is the persistence landscape. It's a sequence of functions. Um, for example, um, the blue here is lambda one, the orange is lambda two, and so on. It's a sequence of functions. And in particular, um, you can recover the persistence diagram from this persistence landscape. So it's a complete invariant of persistence diagrams. And again, um, if you um, discretize this um, real line like this, and sample points from these functions, you get a vector. And you can imagine um, you get a vector for each one of these lambdas. And if you combine them all together, you end up with one really long vector, which somehow um, captures a bunch of information about your persistence. And again, you can put that into a machine learning pipeline. Um, OK, one last thing on this before I um, wrap up. Um, these persistence landscapes, they're functions from um, the naturals across the reals to the reals. And they're actually they're integrable functions. So they live in a Banach space. Um, and I'm not going to get too much into statistics. So what this essentially means is that they satisfy a kind of central limit theorem. And in particular, if you take um, integrals of these persistence landscapes, so sum the area under every single curve in your persistence landscape, um, you get a real value drawn variable, which satisfies a central limit theorem. So you can use this to do parametric statistical tests based on your topology. So kind of topological statistics, which I think is quite neat. Um, okay. So to summarize, there are two vectorizations of persistent homology, persistence images and persistence landscapes, which you can um, use for machine learning if you like. Um, okay, any questions on those vectorizations before I move on to the very last part of the talk? Okay, fantastic. Uh, what other vectorization methods are promising candidates? Um, that's a good question. Um, I am not much of an expert on um, vectorization. My favorite by far is the persistence landscape. As far as I'm aware, and I, I don't want to um, say anything that might be terribly wrong, as far as I'm aware, there aren't any that stand out more than those two. Um, I'd be very happy if anyone else knows of some more examples if they wanted to point them out. Um, but yeah, I, I don't have any more examples to give you right now. Um, okay, let me uh, move on to the last part. So this last part is essentially just mentioning things that I haven't had time to mention. Um, so we had a question earlier about what happens if we add uniform noise to our um, point cloud. So here's a circle. And it's all well and good if we perturb these points or have a stable persistence diagram. But for example, if I added a bunch of points in the middle, I would completely lose this um, topological feature. I'd lose this hole in the middle of my point cloud. Um, and one way to fix this is um, to basically remove points according to how dense they are. And so you can imagine this is kind of a different um, parameter I can use to alter my filtration. And if I combine both these parameters, so instead of um, having a filtration in this direction, I also filter in this direction, 
I kind of get a two by two grid of some facial complexes all joined together. So I have one there, which joins to one here and so on. Um, and this is called a multi-parameter persistence module. Um, studying these things is a really, really active area of research. Um, they're very, very difficult to study. Essentially, um, the problem that arises is that there's no kind of neat, um, discrete invariant of these things in the same way that we have a persistence diagram for one parameter of persistent homology. So it's a very active area of research. Um, there's a generalization of um, persistence landscapes to the multi-parameter setting, which is quite promising. And in fact, Heather very briefly mentioned um, an application of that in her talk. So um, yeah, multi-parameter persistence, if you're trying to deal with um, uniform noise, that's the way to go. Um, so you should look into the work of um, Oliver Vipond, who's done some really good work on this stuff. And there are lots of other people as well. Um, and you should look at a piece of software called Rivet, which you can use to compute two parameter persistent homology. Um, so that'd be my recommendation uh, for your questions then. Um, and there are other tools in TDA, which I haven't mentioned other than pH, there's Mapper and the Euler characteristic transform, which you can use to kind of do dimensionality reduction and analyze shapes respectively. And finally, as Heather mentioned in her talk, um, an interesting question is once I have my persistence diagram, how can I look back at my shape and see where the holes are? So can I actually draw, for example, um, a loop around something I think is a hole? Um, this is something which hasn't been studied too much. Um, there's a nice piece of software called Irene, which does this for you. So if you're interested in that kind of question, I'd encourage you to look up Irene. Okay, and finally, um, to point you in the right direction, um, if you're interested in this black box homology, which um, finds holes, you should read the textbook Algebraic Topology by Alan Hatcher, um, which is available for free on his website. Um, if you're interested in persistent homology, then you should um, read Vidit Nanda's lecture notes, which are available for free on his website. Um, and if you're interested in either of the vectorizations I just showed you, um, those are the two papers which introduce them.